definitely, because um, technology was moving on. And although Haig is often criticised unfairly uh, for not ad ad adopting technology, what you see to counter that argument is uh, the adaptation of tanks, the use of tanks in the Battle of the Somme in September 1916. We pioneered the technology. The Germans didn't have it. In fact, the Germans never really rated tanks in the First World War. Uh, but a lot of German officers that fought in the war uh, eventually did, and they became the senior generals of World War II, uh, the big panzer commanders who fought in, in the early stages of the Second World War. But in World War I, we pioneered it, and by the time of the Somme, this technology was ready to use. And any general who is a good commander, if he's given a new weapon that looks to be a decisive weapon, he's not going to say... Uh, I think we'll just leave that for the moment. He's going to want to use it as quickly as possible. And now Haig has been accused of using it too early, but um, 40 odd tanks were available for the first use of ta uh, tanks in 1916. And that was quite a decisive number, really. And some of them did get stuck in the mud. They had mechanical failures. Um, the fumes of the tank engine, for example didn't come out through an exhaust and go outside, the fumes came straight out the engine to the inside of the tank so that the men in the tank were semi-asphyxiated by carbon monoxide, which so it wasn't a very pleasant place to be inside one of these tanks. So there were all sorts of problems with them. But you imagine yourself as a German soldier on the 15th of September 1916 and this huge steel beast is coming straight towards you, making clanking noises, firing machine gun bullets or six-pounder uh, cannon shells, you would think that the devil had just arrived because you've never seen anything like this. So it had a massive effect. And the Germans don't have a word for tank initially. Um, some of the documents I've looked at in German archives refer to it as an agricultural threshing machine. Um, so a machine that went across the fields um, pulling up the, uh, the corn because they didn't know what to call it. And in the end, they called it Panzer. Um, and that isn't the German for tank. It's the German for armor because it's an armored vehicle. So the Germans call it a Panzerkampfwagen, an armored fighting vehicle. Um, and... Uh, the effect on the German soldiers when they first saw that was enormous. But the trouble was, um, the Germans, well, not the trouble was, good for the Germans, but they reacted very quickly to it. So they captured some of the wrecks of these tanks. And they also found in one of them a British soldier's um, bag in which was a diary outlining all the training of the tanks. And within a few weeks, the Germans translated that into German, and it was sent to the headquarters of every German unit on the Western Front. So they were instantly given this information about the new tanks, and then also told how to knock them out by using grenades, strapping grenades together, and throwing the grenade under the track, and it would blow the track off. So it was a good first use of tanks, and Haig should have done it. But once you'd let that cat out the bag, once you'd used it, uh, then the Germans were going to come up with ways of trying to knock these things out, which they did. But as the war went on, the tanks got better, the tanks got um, uh, more effective, and there were larger numbers. So you see, one year on from the Somme at Combray, over 400 tanks being used, and then jump on another year to August 1918, and hundreds and hundreds of tanks are thrown into the Second Battle of the Somme in... Uh, you could describe as the first blitzkrieg, the first lightning warfare against the German positions there and able to smash the Germans on the Somme. So it was right to use them, but they were still in their early stages. Does that, does that answer your questions? Are you happy with that? Um, we'll come back to you, Nacho, in a minute. Um, so I think this is, yeah, one of our last questions, Paul, from uh, Carmen. Hi, Carmen. Hi, Carmen. Hi. Oh, yeah. um, do you know any famous stories of heroes, uh, heroism at the Somme? Do you know any famous stories of heroism at the Somme, in the Battle of the Somme? That, that's, a good, that, that's a good question. And in some respects, you could argue when you know, you've, you've studied 
the conditions of trench warfare, you know how terrible the Battle of the Somme was. You could almost argue that every man that was there was a hero. How did they put up with this? They had to see every single day their mates, their friends, people that they joined up with. In some cases, um, I live near a town called Barnsley in Yorkshire, and they had a POWs battalion. And um, they were men from that town, from the streets just outside my home here, all joined up together. They'd gone to school together. They'd played football and cricket together. Um, they'd run around the fields together when they were children. Um, and now they were at war. And you were seeing the people that you'd grown up with being killed and terribly wounded every day. How did you cope with that? So in some respects, you know, we've got to admire the heroism of all of them were there to be able to put up with that because how did it change them what sort of people were they after the battle of the Somme because they never forgot it I mean I interviewed veterans when they were in their 80s and 90s 75 years after the battle of the Somme and it was as poignant um, and as vivid to them as it was when it happened and they used to cry 75 years later they would cry when they thought about some of the men that had been killed with them. But, of course, if you look at the story of the Battle of the Somme, there are many famous acts of bravery. Um, there was a medal called the Victoria Cross, which was awarded to the highest award uh, given to British and Commonwealth soldiers in the First World War. And uh, the very first Victoria Cross awarded for the Somme was to a, a lad from Northern Ireland called Billy McFadgen who it wasn't for attacking the Germans, it wasn't for running across no man's land, it wasn't for fighting a big battle, it was before the battle had even begun. They were bringing up a box of hand grenades and the hand grenades were dropped, the pins of the hand grenades all came out, the grenades were now all active, five and a half seconds later they were all going to explode and kill everybody in that trench and Billy threw himself onto these grenades to absorb the explosion. So he was killed instantly, but he saved the lives of every man that was in the trench with him. And he became the first British soldier to be awarded the Victoria Cross for an act of bravery um, on the 1st of July 1916. And if you read any book on the Somme, you'll find dozens and dozens uh, of stories, but there were many, many acts of bravery that never went, that were never recognised. Again, one of the veterans I interviewed, he said, I asked him about a man in his battalion who'd been awarded the Victoria Cross, and he said to me, he said, listen, he said, there's two types of crosses in the First World War. There's the Victoria Cross, and there's a wooden cross, and most get the second one, the latter. And what he meant by that was that most men who tried to be brave ended up getting killed and were never given any medal or decoration for it, that all they got was a wooden cross on their grave. And in many respects, they're as much a hero as the men awarded the Victoria Cross or any other type of decoration in that war. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, uh, Paul. That's brilliant. Um, I think, is it Luis, I think? Go on, Luis. Uh, did the Russian Revolution affect the war? Uh, did the Russian Revolution affect the war? Massively, massively, because it threw Russia into turmoil. Um, Germany continued to have troops in Russia, but only up until February 1918. So the Russian Revolution happened in 1917. Um, the fighting still went on on the Russian front, on the Eastern Front. Um, and then the Germans were able to release um, troops from Russia by ending the war there and bringing a million German soldiers from Russia to France uh, in 1918. And that was massively decisive because it suddenly increased the size of the German army in France and it enabled the Germans to launch a whole series of attacks to try and end the war in Germany's favour. Because by that stage, the other aspect of the war was America. America had entered the war in April 1917, but it had this massive, massive army that was not properly trained. But if you jump on to when 
uh, the Germans brought their men home from Russia. By that point, it was now only a matter of months, if not weeks, before the Americans arrived, and the Germans knew that once they did, it would tip the balance in the favour of the Allies, and the outcome of the war would be pretty much guaranteed to be an Allied victory. So using those million men that they were able to release because of the Russian Revolution, they nearly won the war in the spring of 1918 by attacking on the Somme, attacking in Flanders, attacking near Reims, attacking in the Marne, and getting close to Paris again. Uh, but gradually, their offensives slowed down, had tremendous losses, 25 to 30,000 men a day in some of those battles. And of those million men that came from Russia, very, very high percentage of them were dead, wounded or prisoners of war in less than six months. Brilliant. Th thank you, Paul. Um, unfortunately, Paul, we have run out of time. Um, could I just say from me personally, that was absolutely fantastic. I learned a lot myself. <laughs> uh, thank and I, th I think, you know, the guys are going to get a heck of a lot from everything you've said. So th thank you so much for that. And um, we will, I will maybe send you a picture on Twitter of some of their finished assessments so you can see what they've written. Okay. And uh, I'll be in touch again. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks for your time. Okay. Okay.